Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. Um, earlier in, uh, well, in the first part of um, 2021, um, matter of fact, I think it was the 15th of January, a Jewish private school in the United Kingdom was um, disciplined, I suppose you could say, for teaching uh, creationism. And the United Kingdom's National Secular Society was quoted that, of saying, schools that teach creationism as science are prioritising religious indoctrination above the educational rights of the children they teach. So um, that was um, a statement uh, published by uh, Stephen Evans, who was the chief executive of the UK National Secular Society. And uh, they had um, initiated um, and uh, uh, government action against um, a Jewish private school, as I said, for teaching creationism. Now, in response to this, it was interesting that a, um, a scientist who is a nuclear physicist, uh, has his PhD in the area of nuclear physics um, from uh, one of the universities in Canada, actually one of the top four universities. Um, I just can't think of the name of it at the moment. But his name is Dr. Jim Mason. And um, as I recall, his uh, PhD thesis uh, back in the... Uh, late 1960s was actually looking at um, the structure of strontium and rubidium uh, isotopes. And of course, these are isotopes that are used in radiometric dating. So he is really, in terms of that, quite an authority or can speak quite authoritatively in terms of radiometric dating as well. And he is a creationist. He believes in a young earth uh, creation. And he wrote uh, and published on the 1st of April uh, 2021 an open letter uh, that's on the internet. Um, and so it's uh, the name is Jim Mason. If you Googled uh, Dr. Jim Mason, M-A-S-O-N, open letter to uh, Mr. Stephen Evans. And... Um, in this letter, he, he, he starts off by saying, Dear Mr Evans, it was recently reported in the UK that a Jewish private school has been hit by government action for teaching creationism as science. And uh, he names the, the school as being served with a statutory notice. Um, and one of the things that it was being reprimanded for was... Um, that uh, creationism is also taught in geography and science, which is not appropriate. But um, it's interesting that he uh, goes on to point out that one of the doctrines of uh, humanism and one of the, the founding doctrines of humanism is Big Bang and evolution. And what he goes on to argue is that both are articles of faith for the religion of humanism and that if the Big Bang or evolution are taught as science, these, the, the, um, the, uh, a, a school, and that would include state schools, are prioritising religious indoctrination above the educational rights. And so the argument that he's pointing out is that um, humanism is a religion and humanism is a... Um, uh, is, a, is a belief that uh, permeates our education system uh, and is, you know, powerfully pushing, of course, for the teaching of the Big Bang Theory and, um, and evolution. It's interesting in his article, Dr. Mason uh, goes on to point out uh, that if you look at a, a, a dictionary definition of what, uh, uh, of religion, uh, it can be defined as a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies, uh, us and usually involving devotional and ritual observances and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. 
Um, it can also be defined as uh, a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices that are generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects, and such as the Christian religion or the Buddhist religion. And uh, it also a religion can refer to a body of persons adhering to a particular set of beliefs and practices such as the World Council of Religions and so forth. And so it's interesting that um, while the definition alludes to the possible belief in a supernatural being as the creator of the universe, this is not a mandatory requirement of religion. Um, so he, he uh, states that the Buddhist religion as, as specifically identified, for example, would be a religion that does not have uh, this belief. So it's um, as a, a supernatural being, as creator of the universe. And so he goes on to elaborate that the documents that define humanism are, 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 are namely the Humanist Manifesto, and uh, and the Humanist Manifesto 2 and the Humanist Manifesto 3. And these comprise a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature and purpose of the universe. And they contain a moral code um, governing the conduct of hum human affairs. So it's interesting if you look these up on the, on the internet there, you can see that in actual fact... Um, Humanism um, really fits the definition of religion quite well because um, it contains a fundamental set of beliefs generally agreed upon by a number of persons. Um, and humanism represents a body of persons adhering to a particular set of beliefs. He goes on to actually quote some interesting stuff from the uh, Humanist Manifesto um, and he quotes from the third paragraph of the original Humanist Manifest, um, which states, Today's man, larger understanding of the universe, his scientific achievements and deeper appreciation of brotherhood of creator situation requires a new statement of the means and purpose of religion. So it's interesting that um, it then goes on to list uh, another 15 um, uh, affirmations. And it concludes, so stand these theses of religious humanism. In the final paragraph of the Humanist Manifesto 2, it includes the sentence, these affirmations are not a final credo or dogma, but an expression of a living, growing faith. So clearly, and so this clear, these statements clearly identify humanism as a faith. And... Um, and they have their, you know, their statements of faith. And, of course, there was a book written uh, some years ago by Charles Francis Potter entitled Humanism, A New Religion. So it's quite um, interesting. Um, in 1983, too, um, the humanist John J. Dunfay um, uh, wrote in that the uh, the magazine The Humanist, which is the official publication of the Humanist Society, um, an article entitled "A Religion for a New Age," in which he wrote, "Teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers, for they will be ministers of another sort, utilising a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach, regardless of the educational level, preschool, daycare or large state university. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new. The rotting corpse of Christianity together with its adjacent evils and misery and the new faith of humanism. So we can see that this, you know, article which was published in 1983 in The uh, Humanist and the author again, John J. Dunphy, spelt D-U-N-P-H-Y, you can look that up. So here we can we can see that humanism is a religion that is actually being allowed to be taught in our schools. And so I guess let's have a look now what are the doctrines of the religion of uh, humanism. So, and um, remember that uh, the Jewish school 
was disciplined for allowing the uh, teachings of, for example, Judaism, which believes in creation and says there was a a supernatural creator God in the beginning in in Genesis and, of course, and the the flood and so forth, and uh, was disciplined for teaching them. But let's have a look at what the um, humanist people then believe and want taught. The first uh, of the affirmations are that religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Now, that's something, of course, that is totally unscientific. It can't be proved either way, Um, except we have um, a lot of evidence for for creation um, from the point of view of philosophy and, um, you know, the the whole concept of um, if the universe having a beginning and therefore having a cause – The second affirmation is that humanism believes that man is part of nature and that he is immersed as a result of a continuous process. And so the secularists, uh, of course, uh, support the Big Bang Theory and uh, they also um, clearly support the slow and gradual process of evolution. And so deep time, deep time evolution... um, fundamental tenets, it would seem, of the religion of uh, humanism. It's interesting that humanism uh, affirms the origin of the universe and the origin of humans, but it doesn't need to affirm, for example, gravity, electromagnetism or quantum mechanics. Why? Because quantum mechanics, gravity and so forth, are matters of science, and they can be determined and studied by scientific experiment. But the Big Bang and evolution can't. And so it's interesting that if we think about that these two dogmas are apparently considered so fundamental to humanism that they are set out as the first two at the very start of the first document that defines humanism. And, of course, I guess, you know, folks listening might be thinking, well, aren't the Big Bang and evolution proven scientific theories? No, they're definitely not. And um, these theories have not been proven by science to be true. And this is a very important thing to be understood. And this is something that um, uh, Dr. Mason uh, points out um, very early in the piece. You see, not everything that gets called science is actually science. And he points out that it is important to understand that not everything that gets called science is of the same character. And so, for example, he compares physics and cosmology. So cosmology is about the the history of the universe. So, for example... Uh, He quotes a theoretical cosmologist, Dr. James Turner, and um, Dr. Turner writes, the goal of physics is to understand the basic dynamics of the universe. Cosmology is a little different. The goal is to reconstruct the history of the universe. Thus, cosmology, which is where the Big Bang fits, is actually a study of history, using science as an investigative tool So it's sort of the way, uh, you know, uh, forensic science is used to try to solve uh, crimes um, that we, you know, and sometimes you watch TV programs about this. So the forensic scientist tries to construct a history that explains the evidence. But Often there's more than one history, as as comes out in often in courtroom trials and in real life dramas, that explains the evidence. And some histories do a better job than others. For example, in the Bible, we have a record of the creator himself. So the creator who created the universe spoke with humans and revealed the origin of the universe And that's how we know that the universe was created in in six days. And so we know from, you know, the evidence, these are, you know, eyewitness accounts that have been preserved in the Bible. Now, of course, a lot of people 
you know, reject um, the Bible as, as history. And I, you know, and I've, I've talked about that on other occasions too. But when we look at the you know archaeological evidence that we have today, the overwhelming evidence is that the Bible is an accurate account, as well as the fulfilled prophecies that took place. So there's powerful evidence that the Bible is a is a supernatural book. And the other, uh, and so as we continue on down this theme, cosmology may look like science, but it's not a science. The basic tenet of science is that you can do repeatable experiments, and you can't do that in cosmology. And uh, for example, Dr. James Gunn, spelt G U N N, who was professor of astronomy at Princeton University, once said, Cosmology may look like a science, but it is not a science. A basic tent of science is that you can do repeatable experiments as per the scientific method, and you can't do that in cosmology. So that was a statement by uh, Dr. James Gunn, Professor of Astronomy at Princeton University. It's very important to to understand that, that you know the Big Bang is a theory. When we look at the predictions that it makes, so many of them don't fit. And that's why hundreds of scientists have signed, for example, uh, I think it's uh, cosmologystatement.com, I think is the uh, website, but I'm just going from memory there. But hundreds of scientists have signed a statement saying, look, we should stop teaching the Big Bang because it just doesn't fit. The problem is, of course, that if we remove the Big Bang theory from you know science classes, they don't have anywhere else to go. There's really no other satisfactory theory. The theory that explains the origin of the universe is that of a supernatural creator who is outside time and space, in other words, non-physical. And that's exactly how the Bible describes God. It's uh, you know fantastic. And it's the same when we look at evolution. Um, the goal of biology is to study the basic dynamics of living things. Evolution is a little different. The goal of evolution is to reconstruct the history of life on Earth. Evolution may look like a science, but it isn't a science. A basic tenet of science is that you can do repeatable experiments and you cannot do that in evolution. Matter of fact, I've talked about this before in in other issues where people, for example, have bred um, you know, bacteria through tens of thousands of generations. They haven't mutated into a, a new you know, kind of, of bacteria. As a matter of fact, they you know, haven't mutated into a yeast or, or so they're, they're still the same type of bacteria, same kind of uh, bacteria. And so, again, when all the experiments that have attempted to be done, uh, that have been attempted to, um, you know, demonstrate evolution ha- have failed. Sure, we see some types of evolution occurring and you might say, well, hang on, aren't you just contradicting yourself? No, well, evolution is a very broad term and this is where the confusion comes in. Most people, when they think of evolution, is the the where you have some uh, initial light form that slowly mutated, that became worms, that became fish, that became amphibians, reptiles, mammals and so forth and so the change over time. But evolution can refer to any change. And when we get, and it's possible to have mutations that destroy part of the genetic code, and those mutations can you know, create differences. But all the examples that we see of that kind of evolution is, involves the loss of genetic information or the duplication of pre-existing genetic information. We don't see the creation of new body parts as a result of new code being formed, totally new code. And that's what the theory of evolution requires. That's the requirement for it. That has never been observed despite all the experiments and from the biochemistry that we know, it's absolutely impossible because the new code required to make something work is so complex in terms of its involvement in, in the systems because biology works on a systems approach. You know, it's um, everything uh, pretty well is interconnected in biological systems and so there has to be allowances for these when the new code is formed. And so 
Evolutionary biology, in contrast with physics and chemistry, is a historical science. The evolutionists are attempting to explain events and processes that have already taken place. And so, again, what we find is that all the attempted experiments have failed. Matter of fact, the experiments, and I've talked about this on several times before, and it's highlighted in the work of Dr. James M. Tour, um, who's uh, you know a synthetic chemist at Rice University. Um, it's absolutely impossible for a living, simple living cell to arise from non-living molecules. It had to be supernaturally created. I guess um, one of the things that um, is often missed is that science actually can't prove anything to be true. This is uh, quite an interesting, in, in the, and Karl Popper wrote about this. Science can prove theories to be false, and sometimes it struggles uh, to do that. And the problem is that we, um, the popular media, you know, often, um, and even the editors of, you know, some journals fall into this trap. For example, uh, some time ago in um, a, a news section in the journal Science um, that was uh, published some time ago, uh, the title of the May 6 News of the Week story was, At Long Last, Gravity Probe B Satellite Proves Einstein Right. <laughs> One of the uh, things is that, you know, really that um, you, you can't prove Einstein Right. You simply have data that fits the theory at the moment. And it's interesting that it was picked up and the editors um, replied when a... Um, person raised an uh, issue about that. Um, uh, the correspondent was uh, Dr. Charles L. Bennett, who's Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University, um, and uh, who earned his uh, PhD at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the top units in the world, of course. And he actually led NASA's Wilkinson Microwave Anisoptery Probe um, mission and he uh, says, Bennett, its quote here is correct, in that it's an important conceptual point. Science magazine editors blew it. You can't prove something is true. You can have data that fits the theory. And so observing the results that are consistent with the theory does not prove the theory is true, since the same results might also be consistent with some other theory. He uses an example here. For example, suppose you hypothesize that eating a large pizza will fill your stomach. Then you do an experiment to test the theory by eating a large pizza and behold, your stomach is full. But clearly, this is not the only way you might fill your stomach. Your stomach would also be full if you ate a large steak and kidney pie. Observing that someone has a full stomach does not prove that the person ate a large pizza. And, uh, however, observing results that are inconsistent with the theory does prove that the theory is wrong. Thus, for example, if you were to eat a large pizza and your stomach was not full, you could unequivocally conclude that your theory was false. And so concluding that the Big Bang or evolution is correct based on observations that are consistent with predictions of a particular one being considered is simply a classic logical fallacy. The same observations may and indeed are consistent with uh, predictions derived from the Genesis account of creation. And if that's being the case, then these observations cannot be used to assert that either is true, only that the observations do not in indicate that either is wrong. Of course, um, in the case of um, the Big Bang, as I said, we have numerous examples that demonstrate that the Big Bang just doesn't fit the data. And the same with evolution. When we've attempted to make evolution happen and generate new meaningful genetic codes, we just can't do it. It doesn't happen. And so these are very important aspects. One of the things, though, coming back to the original premise was that the Jewish school was disciplined for teaching creation in their schools and yet we find that the evidence for creation fits what we observe. When we 
Um, we also know that the one of the tenets of humanism was to indoctrinate people in the tenets of humanism. The two of the fundamentals, of course, are essentially the Big Bang theory that the universe was self-existent or came into being by itself and uh, the theory of evolution that man arose by purely mechanical uh, processes. And so, again... Really, we need to, if we're going to be consistent, if we're not going to allow creation to be taught in schools, we really shouldn't be allowing um, evolution and uh, the Big Bang Theory to be taught in schools either. So this raises a very interesting point, doesn't it? I think it's something that many people aren't aware of, that we need to remember that a lot of things that are called science in the classroom today aren't science. They're history. Their attempts to reconstruct the past and they can't be proven. On the other hand, when we look at the Bible, the Bible gives us hope that there is a future. Evolution doesn't give us any hope. Humanism doesn't give us any hope for the future. This is just life as is if you happen to be fortunate enough to be, you know, uh, born with good health and in a in a uh, in a well-to-do family, then you'll probably have a comfortable life. If you, you know, born um, in in poverty somewhere and with poor health or where there's a lot of uh, illness and disease, then you know what's the hope. But the Bible says that there's a God that loves everyone the same, and that one day everything is going to be put right. And the thing is that we can believe this because we have the fulfilled prophecies. The prophecies are fulfilled when Jesus would come and what he would do when he did come. And uh, other historical prophecies that history has confirmed that were true, that God revealed to people in the past. And the reason he revealed them was so that people could know that there truly is a supernatural God that is control of things. The Bible is an amazing book, and it's something that I, I recommend everyone. You must read. It gives us hope, real hope, that we can believe. You've been listening to Faith and Science. And remember, you can re-listen to these programs by Googling uh, 3abnaustralia.org.au and click on the Listen button. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio. When a person is lowered into the water of baptism, it's not simply a ritual, an exercise. It's representative of the great work God is doing in a life. A person who comes to faith in God dies to the old life. The old life is gone. By embracing Jesus, you are farewelling the past and entering into a whole new life where Jesus lives in you. Romans 6, 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Those are strong words. One of the reasons a person is baptized by immersion is to demonstrate that baptism is really a burial. The old you is dead and now buried. A new you comes up out of the water to live a new life. God's objective is a remade you. If you'll let him do it, he will totally transform your life today. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word.